Lord, what was really coming to me. We just give thanks to you that for your, you are the faithful witness. You are the firstborn from the dead. You are the prince ruler of the kings of the earth. You are the one who ever loved us and you have freed us from our sins by your blood. And Lord, we thank you for what you were doing and you're making us into a kingdom and priest and to our God and King. And Lord, we say we want everything that you have ordained for us to have, Lord God. We all, I believe everyone here, we want to come into the fullness of knowing you. We don't want just the 30, the 60, but we want the hundredfold. And we know that without you we are nothing and we want you to be high and lifted up in this place but in us even as we leave and oh God we are so grateful to you for how you have connected us with Terry and Josiah and Isaac Lord we thank you with all of our heart for them and their faithfulness to minister to us and Lord we cry out as we do every time that you will give us a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Jesus unveil him to our hearts today oh God and we restrain any power that tries to keep us from hearing and seeing inwardly what you were saying. And we ask for your anointing to come and open our eyes and our ears of our heart to see you, to hear you. Oh, Lord, and we just thank you for for Terry and the word that he has, the depth that you have given to him. And God, we pray for rivers of living water to flow. And we know they already do, but we just cry out for your rivers of living water to flow. And we thank you that what he gives is life. We thank you for the life that's coming forth through this vessel, Lord God. And we pray that you be glorified in all of this, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen, 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 amen. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to those that are joining us online. Uh, we're uh, excited about it. It's amazing how quick a weekend like this goes by. Um, and uh, I, I know that I have been greatly impacted by what God has done this weekend. And I'm, I just trust that each of you have uh, as well. So I'm not going to delay. We will take up an offering later, but for right now, I'm just going to call Terry to come up and uh, bring the word. Thank you, my brother. Love you, buddy. Amen. Well, we'll jump into it. How's that? <laughs> uh, I want to try to reach some sort of an end in this. So uh, we're going to look again uh, quickly at at First Peter. And Second Peter, um, I'm just more calling us to remember what we're told to remember in Second Peter, as Peter's writing. And and I'm combining First and Second Peter. I, I'm not. I don't think it's in a wrong way. I'm looking at the message of God through His servant Peter in these two epistles, and I'm bringing them together because they are together, uh, not necessarily in time, but in God's heart and focus. You know. That's the way it is, isn't it, brother? <laughs> Just the way it is. And so I want the reality of that. I want to be able to let the Holy Spirit take the written word and rebuild Christ in me. Uh, he knows how to do that if I let him. Don't you? I'm not interested in knowing something. Can you hear what I'm saying? I'm interested in knowing somebody. I'm interested in life, not doctrine not truths from the Bible. I don't want to feed us truths from the Bible. I want to feed us the truth that the Bible points to, and his name is Jesus. <laughs> Amen. We can be filled with truths. What good are they? We need to be filled with life. Hello? <laughs> so just I and I, Isaac, none of us have a desire, uh, Brian and Ken, none of us have a desire to preach Things, nor the things of God or doctrinal things, though they may be true. What does it matter if I don't know him who is true inwardly? So we're preaching about a person of life who is the truth, who is the way, right? So I want to be clear. And what I have to say this morning, the reason I would say such things is going to 
because of the emphases uh, that I'm going to make in these passages that are made in these passages, I don't want us to lose uh, the overarching theme of all things and all themes, all things and all themes, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Don't you think, Daniel? Christ in us, the hope of glory. Christ in his people, corporately, the hope of glory. Christ being the glorious God himself. So, so let's read then, keeping in mind 1 Peter 3, but 2 Peter chapter 3. Beloved, this is now the second letter I'm writing to you in which I stir up your sincere mind by reminder to remember the ramas. I emphasized that the first night, right? Remember the ramas. You know, I'm just asking the Lord by his spirit to make that real in me. Not a remembrance because, okay, I got it locked away in my brain. I don't think that's what God shoots for is your brain. God's not shooting toward our intellect. He's conquering it. He's coming straight spirit to spirit. Did you know that your brain has the capacity, this is simple, to send signals to your entire body? Did you know your heart does too? Did you know that? that you, how many know that your heart doesn't have the same capacity of the brain, but your heart? They, science has discovered this of recent. Your heart has the capacity to send signals to your body like the brain. So when the Bible talks about the heart in the way that it does, it's not wrong. Hello? That your heart can send signals to the brain? Your heart can send signals to the other parts of your body? You know, <laughs> before science discovered it, they, you know, people, oh, well, that's just imagery. God's focusing upon the inner man. No, he's talking about the heart. <laughs> Guess what? God knew. I may be and am. I say dumber than a post. I think a post is actually smarter than me. It knows how to shut up. <laughs> so so uh, just think, you got somebody up here preaching that is not as smart as a post. But it's not about intellect. It's about life. We are givers of life, of the man of wisdom, of the son of life and the son of truth and the son that is the way. We are not givers of doctrine and truth or truths. We are offering a person of life. And we fail in any message if that is not what is going on by the Spirit. If the Spirit is unable to engage God's people's hearts and thus through the engagement of the heart sends signals to the rest of our being. God is speaking. God is engaging you. Then what's this all for? An intellectual Christianity is a dead Christianity. We have way too many. I agree with people, but not in the same reasons. I don't like long sermons when it's coming from dead people because it's a dead sermon. I don't have to care how much I love them. The truth is the truth. If you're shooting for the head, you are missing the Holy Spirit. But if it's the oracles of God being spoken by the power of the Holy Spirit, life-giving, if we can receive that life and that light and the truth as he is, the way that he is, the beginning, the alpha, the omega, the end, the goal. We can receive him. Then the oracles of God are coming forth. It is a way of discerning messages. And how do you put a time limit upon that feeding that is going on? We in the church have invented sermonettes for Christianettes. It was said to me in Bible college, they can only uh, hear what their butt is actually able to be comfortable with and stay in. 
Now that's Christianity for you. Since when does your butt lead the way? <laughs> Since the last several hundred years, actually. So that's the answer to that. So Christ would preach all day the next day and the next day after that, and the people were there to hear. Now we're not going down that path. Aren't you glad? But neither am I interested in sermonettes. If it's a sermonette coming from a dead preacher or teacher, I don't have five minutes to give to them. I'll just walk out. Doesn't that sound spiritual? <laughs> Since the Holy Spirit's not here, I'm gone too. <laughs> Maybe I don't mean that the way perhaps people would think I mean that. I'm simply saying if we can recognize what's by the Spirit. See? So I'm saying this to say, give Brian some grace over the next three and a half hour message that he's given. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> you know that, Angie? Give him grace, will you? <laughs> I'm, fly, I'm flying around, messing around. So when I talk about remember the rhemas, which I'm about to do about the rhemas of God and their importance to us, let me clarify up front, and I'll say it again. Rhemas are important because they bring us to the Lord that we might know him and we might be in the good of the relationship. If we miss that part of the importance of the rhema, we're missing the main part. These who heard the rhema of God were brought to him, impacted by him. There's an exchange of divine life, divine will, divine purpose for their miserable lives without God. Amen? Amen? So I'm in favor of the rhemas of God if we're getting to Christ as life because that's surely the main component of why God would speak to a vessel, to bring that vessel into the good of his life, of his will, of his purpose, of his intent. And if he so desires, then through that vessel to deliver that rhema that offered the life, the truth of God, his will, his way to others. Is that, am I being clear? So as much emphasis as I'm about to, biblical emphasis as I'm about to give to the Ramas, it's important to my heart that I be clear, as it is it important to you guys that I be clear. So remember the Ramas. That's not the first time this is actually stated in the scriptures. Go figure. But sometimes the translations hide the real translation. And entire doctrines are made off of stupid stuff. <laughs> what a way of saying that, huh? I find most doctrines are stupid. Most people can't tell they have a doctrine. I don't have any doctrines. And then people proceed to tell us their doctrines. My doctrine is Christ. I was told by the Lord himself in a direct encounter standing in front of me and by God the Father himself as well. God the Father said it this way, my doctrine is my son. Believe in him, Terry. That's what I ask you to do. Don't believe in anything other than my son. Well, some of us won't argue that point, but, 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 but there are no buts. The truth is a person. The way is a person. The life is a person, and God gave him. He didn't give doctrines. This word speaks to him. That's why he's the truth. That's why this word is true. It would not be true if it was not about the truth. But it is about him, and Jesus said so. You search the scriptures because you think life is in them. That's the intellectual. That's the scholar. Paul has something to say about that. Where is the scholar? Where are they? Where's the philosopher? Where are they? God has made them of no effect. It is by his spirit. <laughs> Hello? It don't matter if it's Greek or church in Corinthians there. It does not matter. I'm telling you, he came that we might have life. We may have him in abundance. Do not get your head filled with Bible knowledge. Get filled with the Holy Spirit. That is is the seal of God at work. He has sealed us by giving us his spirit. Amen. Amen. 
I mean, it's okay to shout, right? I mean, I mean, come on, guys. We're talking about the life of someone who is the creator, him living inside of us, God the Father living in you, the Holy Spirit living in you, the entire Godhead is inside of you. I think that deserves a shout. <laughs> Amen. Let's shout. Don't you think, Drew? We got something to shout about. <laughs> We have the living one living inside of us, and no other part of the creation does. You do, period. God has taken up residence and made you his dwelling place. That is glorious, isn't it? <laughs> so this uh, concept of ramas, why would Peter call them to remember the ramas, especially in this context, speaking of the end? And the context is speaking of the end in both 1 Peter and 2 Peter. So let's then look at some other passages. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 11, okay? And I guess I'll open my notes. A real simple note, keep it simple, stupid. That's what it says here. I just like, <laughs> can't believe I wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> playing. <laughs> Don't you love how God comes in on your own personality? Flawed as personality is. Your own quirkiness, my own stupid humor. I love it when the Lord uses my own humor. Uh, sometimes for me, sometimes against me. <laughs> I love it. You know, I remember the time the Lord told me because I, I uh, when I came under divine disruption 23 years ago, divinely disrupted to where I wanted to get out of the ministry because I didn't know the gospel. That's after being born again when I was 17. I didn't know Christ as the gospel, thus I didn't know how to preach the gospel of Christ. And I wanted to get out of the ministry. I had it all worked out. Well, Paul was three years in Arabia. You know, God doesn't listen to those kinds of things. I mean, he does, but he don't ever respond to it other than, I'll tell you how he responded. You know what your problem is, Terry? You're afraid. <laughs> he said, I aim to convince you that I'm more capable and powerful to do what needs to be done than what you are. So, you know, I had it all laid out. I'm going to get out of the ministry and learn Christ and learn how to preach Christ and uh, you know, Paul did, and that was my excuse. And uh, he wouldn't go for it. No, I'm going to send you out there, and here's how it's going to work. You're going to stand up there and look stupid, and I'm going to come to do something in the hearts of people. That's how he said it. What do you think about that, Dylan? Am I accomplishing that this morning? <laughs> yes. Thank you. <laughs> God works through the weak things. Not the strong, not the wise in their own eyes, not the intelligent, not the scholars. You know that God never sends Gabriel to scholars? He never has and he never will. And that scholars never know the will of God, never know the times of God. They have only their exegesis, as stupid as it is. And the voice of God is lost. Biblically, it's completely backed up what I just said. God chooses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Don't listen to fools who are wise in their own eyes. Listen to the Lord inwardly by the Spirit, life in the Spirit. There you will know what the Spirit is saying to the church. Amen. So Hebrews chapter 1. That's good no matter what you thought about that statement. <laughs> it's the truth. Doesn't mean you have to be a dummy, but you better not be wise in your own eyes, nor had I better be. Our vast intelligence will never reveal Christ. This little pea thing you have rolling around in your head like me is laughable to God. And God's not inhabiting your little pea. He's inhabiting your spirit. He's not speaking from your brain. He's speaking from the Spirit. 
but you don't understand my IQ. Yeah, I do. I know how low it is <laughs> compared to God. <laughs> so anyway, now faith is assurance of things being expected. I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on this verse so, and these verses. Now faith, let's back up to verse, the last verse of chapter 10. Uh, there were no chapters in the original. But we are not of those shrinking back to destruction, but of faith to a perseverance of the soul. Now the writer, I believe it's Paul, going to explain faith. We are not of those shrinking back to destruction, but of faith. In my opinion, they put the chapter heading in the wrong place. Uh, sometimes in the, you can buy Bibles like this where there's no chapters. You know, Jesus never, because there were none, he never said, well, turn to Isaiah chapter, chapter, chapter. He just said, in the book of Isaiah. <laughs> Isn't that right? Because there were no chapters. But we pride ourselves on scripture memorization. But do we have the life of Christ that's being spoken now? See how intellect works? You may be smarter than me. So what? Who cares? When we stand before the Lord, he's coming spirit to spirit with us. What's the measure of Christ that I've seen it? I've had him look right at me, standing in front of me. Not in a vision either. He wasn't speaking, he wasn't speaking to me. I'm like, what is it? What's wrong? I'm, <laughs> I'm looking to see how much of me is in you. Pitifully small, I'm afraid. By faith. Now, faith is the assurance of things being expected. An inner conviction of things not being seen. For by this, the men of old were confirmed. This verse is an astounding verse, what I'm about to read. We understand the ages to have been put right by faith in a rhema from God. There's the right translation. Let me read it again. We understand the ages. I'll explain of need. I took Greek, but uh, I fear what I know because it can get into intellectualism really quick. I took it in, in college, Bible college. several semesters of it. I used to uh, pride myself on my ability to use the Greek language until God put the slap down on me and broke me before him and started doing a deep interpersonal work. Let me know real quick, that's foolishness to me, son. Don't do it again. You're shooting for the head. This Holy Spirit's not a part of it. He's not working with you in this. He's bringing the revelation to me. And if you're not, he won't work with you. He won't participate in your sin. Is that clear enough for us? Hello? So if I talk about a Greek word here, it's not so, well, look, I'm better than, has nothing to do with that. It's simply to bring clarity to this verse, which needs clarity. Because it's an astounding verse. We understand the ages to have been put right by faith in a rhema from God so that the things being seen have not happened out of the things being visible. So a rhema of God is a revelation. It's this lengthy but let me read what I wrote down. The revelation by and of God concerning his divine person, his divine eternal purpose, the will of God coupled with the work of his spirit unto divine inward 
and corporate life. So personal and corporate life, truth, and the way. In Christ, of Christ, and because of Christ. God, according to his own choosing, brings that revelation, that rhema, to a person, to a messenger. We're about to read about them in chapter 11. A few of them. I want you to think of the consequences of what I just said. How the ages are marked by God's release of a rhema to a messenger. And then he proves it in chapter 11. Now, I'm not being unbiblical in what I'm saying. I'm being perfectly big biblical. It is a fact, and God's about to prove it by talking about the vessels, the messengers. So, Brian, so, Josiah, Isaac, Ken, others in this room. God's call to be a messenger is no small fry. It is not an elevation of the vessel. It is a purpose of God in the vessel that God speaks to that vessel. And he changes the ages of human history by doing it. Let me say it again. I'll read it, more of it to you in a moment. God changes the ages of human history by speaking to the vessel because he can. And until the vessel is there, he can't. So time itself is altered, changed, progressively is what I'm referring to by a messenger being able to hear the rhema of God for the time and purpose and will eternally of the Godhead. That's what this verse is saying. And it's not the only verse, we'll see others. That Ramah's purpose is to bring that vessel to the Lord and possess it so that like Noah, as we will see and we talked about last night and the night before, Noah becomes the Lord's and he is not of this world. Can you see what's going on there relationally? The rhema is meant to trigger a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ who is the Logos and the rhema of God. The rhema himself, the Logos himself, speaks the rhema and orders God's next step of time in human history by his encountering. He, the Lord himself, who time speaks to, answers to, and obeys, triggers it if a vessel is willing to receive it. I don't have to tell you what's going on in the room. We're on holy ground. God desires something, guys, and for us to understand what he's doing in our time, as it was in the days of Noah, so it is now. God has released Rhema. The Rhema himself has released Rhema. And we are on the threshold of the change of an entire age. And I do not back down from saying what is the obvious No more than Noah would. We cannot, we must not, for what kind of a messenger are we? If we do not understand the times we're in, you're not a messenger and you have nothing to say. <sighs> Everything's going to be so weak because the rhema himself, the truth himself, the life himself, the person is revealing himself and his will to come to the next stage of human history and bring fullness and completion in the church is death. We argue rather than recognize the principle of God going all the way back. If the end is going to come, then God himself will trigger it by the rhema. It won't come through doctrine and eschatology or any of that stuff. God will speak, and he'll be its end and fulfillment in a people. 
Amen. He is holy. He is everything. He is the living word himself. So let me go on. God, according to his own choosing, brings that revelation, that rhema of himself, being the rhema, to the person, to the messenger, and then through the messenger, unto a people. Through the messenger, the word, the rhema, the logos and rhema Christ, and then the rhema of Christ representing himself and his plan and his purpose and who he is as a person comes to the vessel singularly is the history of it that we're about to see. Whatever that vessel is, however many messengers there are, they're going to receive the rhema of God, even if they're receiving it from one messenger to the next. We understand that principle and how thus God works. I'm thankful that Noah's wife and his children and their, their wives received the rhema that came to Noah because God did not speak to them. He spoke to him. But they received it, believed it, and became messengers themselves of life right in a crooked, perverse environment and generation that God had already declared, this flesh going on, I'm going to end it. And now I'm going to tell you, the flesh that's going on in the church and in the world around us, God has said it. We're not coming and deducing this from the scriptures. You can't. You will never arrive at any end from the scripture. The scriptures will point you right to God being the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end. And he will declare it to a vessel who can receive it. May it be a corporate one. And then the end will come. That is divine order and that is divine principle. And we're in it, living in the day of it, while the church is arguing with its doctrines against it. God has released Gabriel and the church wants to argue. God himself is appearing and speaking. He did this morning with a red, dressed in red and a red cape with a sword drawn in front of me, but not on the white horse. A direct revelation out of Revelation 20, or Revelation 19, standing in front of me while you were singing, Drew. Yes, Terry. Yes, you are in the time of the end of the age, and I will end it. And yes, and think of this, Drew, because of what, how the Lord was leading you. It was so beautiful to me. I don't see it very often, so I take note of it. Yes, there will be wars. And yes, there will be Babylon. And yes, there will be a leader of Babylon like Nebuchadnezzar. And by the way, Daniel 2, quick lesson. Babylon, right? Persia, right? Greece and Rome. And wrapped up in that final empire of Rome was all the three kingdoms that preceded it, both geographically and spiritually in a negative way. And it will be so again. God himself, read it, will cast down Babylon. Now let me ask you, do you see how much in Babylon we already are? How many can see the fact of that? We are in Babylon, so it hasn't been cast down. <laughs> like Revelation declares. The Lord's going to destroy it in one hour, it says. First he's going to get it out of us so that like Noah, we are not of Babylon. Amen. Can you say amen to that? We are at the end of an age, Randall, are we not? God aims to end Babylon just like he said, and he's the only one that can, and believe me, he will. He, this is Thessalonians, right? He will destroy by the brightness of his own appearing and the breath of his own mouth. Read it in Revelation 19. The two-edged sword comes out of his mouth. He strikes the nations with a rod of iron. They grab hold of the beast and the false prophet and cast them into the fire. Has that happened yet? You better believe it hasn't. Will it? It absolutely will. Babylon is going to fall. <laughs> There's a rhema. <laughs> right out of the scripture. 
We need the Lord to make the scriptures ramus to us so that it's living and active and like a two-edged sword. Is that not right? The word, that word of God. Logos and rhema. He's both. Christ is. Well, let me go on. So, sorry to get so excited about it. It's exciting times. Y'all know that? This, I, I've not deduced what I'm saying from looking in the scriptures. You can't. And that's what these scriptures are saying. God triggers it by the rhema. <laughs> what do you think, Matt? That's why they won't translate this verse rightly. They don't like the meaning. More, more than likely, they don't understand its meaning. Because most of the people as translators have never heard of Raymond. If they heard it, wouldn't believe it. That's what intellect will do for you. <clears throat> the Rhema comes directly from a God encounter with Christ. The rhema. The rhema can come by other messengers as well, such as angels. The rhema can come through the human messenger to other messengers and to the people of God. If you can tell what I'm about to say by reading Hebrews 11, the ultimate purpose of God is in the knowing of the Lord himself, trusting the Lord himself, depending upon the Lord himself, knowing him relationally, I mean intimately within, in a living way, not knowing the scriptures that talk about him, but knowing him whom the scriptures are written about. Is that not true? It also makes us believe God's purpose is to cause us to believe and to understand where we are in time and what is about to happen, what he is about to do, both within and in the earth. These rhemas speak, spoken of here, this rhema spoken of, or rhema spoken of in Hebrews chapter 11 have nothing to do with worlds. It has to do with human history and God's history with humans. Right? So, God's will is to make a vessel then, as we will see, of faith. And Hebrews 11 is screaming that fact at us. The rhemas, the rhema himself and the rhemas he releases are meant to bring that vessel, who hears it, to a place of faith in the person. Was he successful? Let's read on. Right? By faith, there you go. The whole entire context, let me remind you, is that what rhemas from the rhema are meant to produce in a living way within a vessel. And now we're going to see the testimony of God to and concerning that vessel who did believe, who did receive, and then did come forth in the faith of the Son of God. By faith, Abel offered to God a more abundant sacrifice. You know what the verse is saying in context of the Ramas? That God spoke to Abel about the right sacrifice, and he obeyed, Daniel. He listened. He received. Isn't that beautiful, brother? Absolutely. I want to be like that, don't you? I want to be like these ones we're reading about. I don't have faith in faith. I have faith in the rhema himself and in the logos himself and it's his ability to time things and alter rightly to God's will human history by a vessel to whom the rhema speaks a rhema. And that's what's being shown here. Thank God that somebody believes. You know it, Scott? Thank God. Because he'd have done it quicker had he got, could have found somebody in this right, Denise, who would have believed him. So can we see the plot of the devil? 
to keep us from listening, at least listening, to the reign of God? Because Lucifer knows what we don't. Human history is altered by the rhema. See the plan? You see how we've fallen into a trap? Most of the words we want to hear is to us, about us. How self-seeking, how self-serving, how self-promoting is that? God has something to say, but uh, it's beyond that. He may say some things to us. He should. That should be coming from life in the Spirit. Shouldn't be the main function of prophets, messengers. Their main function deals with the Lord as the Logos and the Lord as the Rhema. Their main function is the presenting of Christ to the church because they're receiving from God Ramas concerning who he is. There's that realm. Then there's this realm. Let me say it again. To world altering, human history altering, that's what I mean by that, Rhema. You better know this. I have to know it. You have to know this. Whenever history is about to be changed by God, and he's the one who will do it because he's Alpha and Omega, he's beginning and end, look for the rhema because it will surely be there. Listen, hear, pay attention, spirit to spirit. Thus, the whole context. Let's continue on. Remember, the context is Abel heard the rhema of God and obeyed. And he was approved of God because of faith in what God, the rhema, had said. Amen. Amen. By which he was declared to be righteous, God testifying about his gifts, and by it, through though having died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch. Here we go again. Enoch heard the rhema himself speak a rhema to him. At least one time. And he was translating. <laughs> Tell me there's not power in the rhema of God speaking. And he was translated so as not to see death. Do you think like Simeon, he knew he wasn't going to die because God had told him? Simeon knew that, didn't he? I'm not dying until I see the Lord's Christ. Most people around him thought that old man's crazy. <laughs> what about Anna, 104, 106 years old? Hey, that little baby right there, that's the Messiah. That's the fulfillment of Genesis 3.15 you're holding there. When God promised to Eve a seed, and that that seed, it says, he will crush the head of the serpent. And has the serpent's head been fully crushed yet? Not yet. Will it be? Yes. And Anna saw in a baby. Now that's spiritual sight coming from relationship with God, just like Simeon. And the church doesn't understand it anymore. The people in Judaism didn't understand that kind of relationship with Christ. But Enoch had it without the law. David had it in spite of the law. <laughs> Isn't that true, Matt? In spite of the law. David's outside the law when he commits the unforgivable sin as far as the law is concerned. If you do this kind of sin and you're blood guilty, by murder, there's no law that, there's no sacrifice for you. You're, you're toast. That's the truth. But David knew God too well and knew that does not speak of God. I'm going to appeal to the one I know. Forgive me. And God did. Now that's relationship, is it not? The law says you die. David said, uh-uh. <laughs> not in pride. He knew the Lord. <laughs> We're all toast without the Lord. The law will just verify that we are. It doesn't have the life to change the situation. Christ does. There's the covenant. Amen. Anyway, you guys know that, but I enjoy talking about Jesus. I am very uncomfortable talking about myself. I should be, but very comfortable talking about Jesus because he is the way, the truth, and the life. And he's coming. Maranatha. 
the Lord comes. And he's saying so very clearly. I don't care what people are saying. I don't care what demons are saying. They're never going to know the truth. And when they hear the messenger say it, they're going to intensify their battle around the messenger. Right, messengers? Hello? Oh, it's glorious to be a messenger. You can have it from me if you want it. Cheap, like zero. <laughs> if it could be given, I would. I can tell you, it's what Mr. T said in that fight with Rocky those years ago. What's your thoughts for the fight tonight? Pain. That's the way I view the messenger calling. What's your thoughts for this fight, Terry? Pain. That's what. On us. <laughs> We're given over to death so that life can work in you. That's the way that works. That's called the nature of the lamb. Right? So, yeah, that's a high heavenly calling. It's called... It's called death. <laughs> but I can still laugh about it. So let's go on. Then by faith Enoch was translated so as to not see death. It was not found because God translated him. He had a rhema from God that it would happen. That's the whole backdrop and con context of this passage. The rhema of God triggered this in Enoch. Or this wouldn't be being said. And he had faith in what the rhema himself had said to him. And he had the right relationship, just like Abel. Abel was declared to be righteous before God. That's the relationship he had. Enoch was declared to walk with God. See how the rhema triggered relationship? Lest we miss that point. Their knowing of the Lord And if that point's missed, we miss the main point. It's not enough to know the rhema that God's going to go do something. He'll do it without you if you're not fit as a vessel to be a part of it. It's relational. It's coming into the reality of it, right? Before, but before or for before his translation, it, was, it has been declared to have been well-pleasing to God. Now, without faith, it is impossible to be well-pleasing. So the rhema triggered in Enoch a walk with God that was well-pleasing to the Lord. He believed God. He believed the God who spoke to him and perhaps appeared to him in that speaking. Don't know that for sure, but we know a rhema was there, and the rhema himself may have been there. Don't know how that revelation came. Some of them we do in this. Moses we do. But they believed in him. And they walked with him. And they became his by possession. And they were no longer of this earth. Abraham knew that. He's looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. And it's not on this earth. Is that not right? See what relationship will do. Relationship is a sanctifying dynamic that sets you and I apart to the Lord. We belong to the Lord. Put your hand on your heart for a moment. I belong to you, Lord. I was created by you for you, but I'm saying this in response. Yes, I belong to you. Isn't that glorious? Yes, Lord. What a privilege. What an honor. What a glorious reality. I belong to him. <laughs> so... <clears throat> <clears throat> Let's just go down to Noah here. By faith, Noah. I've been centered around this, the days of Noah and Noah, uh, how God threw a rhema, and you can read about it, right? Genesis 6. We'll turn there in just a second. Um, by faith, Noah, having been warned concerning the things not yet seen, Where's that? Well, we know where it is. We can read about that in Genesis. You want to do that real quick? I know time's getting away. But how am I going to live up to long-windedness if I don't <laughs> prolong this? <laughs> you know, Dylan, my real desire is to grow to that place to where it's an all-day sermon like Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> totally kidding. <laughs> You know what I'm doing, right? I'm rubbing salt in the wounds of those who don't like long messages. Challenging you. 
Now, if Brian's preaching as a dead man, death, and he's not, at least, you know, I believe that. Angie said otherwise, but I'm pretty sure that. I'm totally kidding, Angie. I'm totally joking. That's terrible. That's what comes with knowing me. Believe me, you don't want to know me. You want to know the Lord. <laughs> this sad, sad, sadistic humor. <laughs> so anyway, um, you know, guys, messages that are filled with life are not boring if that life is Christ. If he's offering Christ like Brian and Ken do, like Isaac and Josiah do, and like one day when I grow up, I want to be like Josiah and Isaac and Brian and Ken. I don't give that much faith or hope. Mine's in the Lord, not me. <laughs> but if we're offering that, time flies when you're enjoying the Lord. Whether you're before him in that place of communion and he's your daily bread, or you're hearing him proclaimed. It's a beautiful thing, Al, don't you think, brother? Beautiful, Daniel. Beautiful, Matt. Beautiful, Sherry. Beautiful. Now, I wouldn't call this message beautiful, but the Lord's beautiful. <laughs> That's who's beautiful. Anyway, uh, Christ is such an eternal subject of life. Hard to talk rightly about him in 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes. But the church is bought into sermonettes for Christianettes whose butts are aching after five minutes, let alone 30. <laughs> Even though we have padded seats, it don't matter. You had a butt ache when you came in, you got one while you're here, and you got one when you left. <laughs> I hope butt doesn't offend you since we all have one. <laughs> Some of us, <laughs> don't forget that one. <laughs> that would have been too full true. <laughs> you may not have to pull your pistol on that one, brother. <laughs> what is about to say? <laughs> oh, well. Given time, my humor gets the better of me. <laughs> so here in Genesis, God's talking to Noah, right? Then God said to Noah, Genesis chapter 6. Right, verse number 13, then God said to Noah, see the rhema? There's your rhema, right to Noah. I have decided to put an end to every creature. Can you hear what I'm trying to get at, though? You think that this age is, come, is coming to an end without the rhema? Can we just get rewired for a moment? Do we really believe that this age, like the age we were dealing here with Noah, is going to come to an end without the rhema? without the rhema himself speaking the rhema? Is it not true that, and I'm, I'm not claiming to be this. In fact, I don't believe this about myself. Is it not clear, true that God does nothing except that he reveals it to his servants, the prophets? Is that true or not? Well, you can read about them right here in, Genesis, in, in Hebrews 11. God speaks. Rhema speaks the rhema. Triggers the end of an age and the beginning of a new one. Isn't that something, Denise? Isn't he glorious? So do we believe, well, I hope not, do we believe that this age is going to end without God bringing the rhema, the rhema himself, bringing the rhema to us of his intentions? How do we know we're ready when God tells us we are? <laughs> Ultimately, that's the truth. It's the work of the Lord in us, but you're not going to know you're ready to. He says so. Right? How do we know the end of our age is upon us? Because the rhema of God is being spoken. And let us not miss it as did the people in the days of Noah so that only eight were saved. 
Can you hear where I'm coming from then? This is not just a little nice message. We are up against something. We have so much unbelief in the people of God that the reign of God can again come after some years and years and years. And I'm talking about the kind of rhema where it's world ending, history, human history changing and altering. So it's another step in the will and divine purpose eternally of God it is upon us and our generation. And we're stumbling over the rhema. We're fighting it scripturally while being blind to the truth of Hebrews 11. And Ephesians 2 and Matthew 24. <coughs> right? Matthew 28. Go forth and preach to the end of the age. The age is going to end. Christ said it. Paul knew it. Peter knew it. Do we? This Babylonian system, by the word of God, I'm talking now the scriptures, has declared that Babylon will be destroyed. What we see around us will no longer exist. Right? <laughs> so God speaks to Noah, I've decided to put an end to every creature, for the earth is filled with wickedness because of them. Is that not true in our time? The leaders of, this is Psalm 2, the kings, the leaders of the world are taking their stand against Christ, are they not? Have they not in the past? Yes, but it, we have come to a combination. And by the delay that has happened in the church and not being willing to make herself ready and be made ready, we have come to indeed what Paul would call perilous times, right? Where people are more lovers of themselves than ever before. But it isn't just that. We've come to a time of technology where they want to control everything. And had the church made herself ready, we would have never come to this time because we weren't meant to be in this time. It was meant to be back here. So can you say with me, it, as bad as it is, it could be worse. Therefore, let me not be the cause of delay any longer. So God tells Noah, this is what's going to happen to the earth. And let's continue on. Make yourself an ark. Noah then knows what the rest of the world won't listen to, though the other seven members of his family actually thankfully listen to the messenger Noah. You know, some of you have known Brian since he was a little squirt. <laughs> Just a twig. <laughs> he can be quite offended by the Brian now that stands in front of you, who is a messenger of the Lord, chosen. Don't take offense at the Brian now because of the Brian you once knew. Give God more credit in Brian than that. Now, Brian slipped me a $50 bill to say that. <laughs> I asked for 100 but I didn't get it. <laughs> so I'm only giving half of what I told him I was going to. <laughs> Are not terrible. <laughs> what do you think, Gina? Pretty bad, huh? <laughs> oh well. It's easy to get offended at messengers when you know them. You see their flaws. Of course, they see yours too. They just don't treat you the way you do them. <laughs> see, I can say that here at the gathering, I'd already been stoned. Because <laughs> there's some scripture out there somewhere. <laughs> Don't repay evil with evil. <laughs> oh, how I wish that wasn't in the Bible. <laughs> no, I'm totally kidding. That's a nature of God issue. <laughs> Make yourself an ark. Did he obey the rhema 
who spoke to him and maybe appeared to him, did he obey what the rhema said to him in rhema? Yes, he did, right? So we can see that happening, but it happened with Abel, right? Happened with Enoch, happened with others. I'm just pointing that out so that when we read the book of Hebrews, we understand from what's being said what's being triggered. I got to get a little faster here. I know that sounds impossible, but let's see. Anybody enjoying this besides me? I find that the scriptures are so beautiful when God sheds the true light of life, Christ, upon them. When the Holy Spirit takes the scriptures and brings Christ to the forefront. When he's revealed to be the Logos, when he's revealed to be the Rhema, when he's the revealed to be the Keros, when he's revealed, he's, he is grace. He, when he's revealed to be everything of life, truth, and way, he is. He is time itself. And is actually written that way in the scriptures. He's the beginning and the end. He is time and beyond it. Human history is bound up with him. Isn't he glorious and wonderful and extraordinary? So, so Noah was warned by what was not seen. God spoke to him possibly appeared to him, but nobody else. Sound familiar, messengers? God's going to say something to you, and he's going to tell the others through you. And then, because God does not want you nor I developing a relationship with Gabriel, but instead a relationship with Christ, he's not sending Gabriel to you. But idiots like me He might send Gabriel. And I just thought I'd hit that nail on the head there. God doesn't have interest in us forming a relationship with Gabriel. That'll happen in the future. He has interest in us forming a relationship with Jesus Christ and showing forth the excellencies of him by life, right? So his point is, I'm not sending Gabriel to everybody. It's not needed. If you know the Lord, you'll know what is the rhema, speaking the rhema. If you don't allow your doctrines to override the rhema, because they surely will. Our doctrines will crush Christ. How does it do that, Terry? By bringing him into that doctrinal box which we can't hear outside of. Because he's not in the box. We are. So Noah hears, does he not? And perhaps sees and he builds an ark. He responds rightly. So that in his response, there could have been many more, but at least his family was delivered. God's heart was for whosoever will. It is said that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He was also one who testified of it and that the ark was being built for a hundred years gave those people opportunity. Now the ark itself would attract people and then they were forced to hear if they wanted to. They were forced to then listen if they asked what Noah had heard. And thus the messenger delivered the message. Hey, guys, God's going to destroy this whole world. So I'm going to tell all of us right here in this room right now, God's about to destroy the entire earth by fire. And that is not a joke. And whatever we count precious out there is about to disappear. And it's not going to happen tomorrow because God's still giving us time to repent. But more importantly, he's making a people ready just like he was Noah, making Noah ready. And he spent 100 years doing it. But I'm telling you, the end of this age is upon us, this generation. So the rhema, 
The rhema's release mark something. What does it mark? And I'm talking about this type of rhema. There's different types of rhema. But this type of rhema of which I speak and has been spoken of here in Hebrews marks a, again, I keep emphasizing this, a change of age. And I want to read about, as I have with rhema, I want to then bring in this word age or ages. The Greek word in its basic form, aeon means age, plural form of it here. So age is. It means this, time as a complete unit, but concerning a specific period, a specific step, a successive step, a successive stage in the, the run of human history with God being spoken of here in its context. It is a component of the time of human history and God advances it by the rhema. That's what's being said. The rhema advances since it's his story, history. God advances his purpose, his story, by the rhema given to one, though, who will believe, who will have faith in the rhema and what he said, the rhema. So when Peter says, let us remember the rhemas, take a step back, let us remember the rhema who still speaks. Is that not true? So God himself in the Son, the rhema, will change human history which God is centered around a vessel that will bring forth his purpose. I said that again the other night. I talked about that fact that time itself is bound up with the vessel. That's what's being said here. In Hebrews chapter 11, the ages themselves are bound by the reign of God, but to a vessel who will believe. And God now in Hebrews 11 is talking about the vessels who believed in their part in God bringing human history to his point, his purpose, through the rhema, releasing the rhema to the vessel, the messenger, that will believe in the rhema himself and what he has spoken. And how human history goes along those lines, stage by step, successively. That's Hebrews 11. So the Greek word aeon, the verse and the context refers to the ages of time in human history and God's history with humans being vessels, messengers now, as they see and hear the rhema himself, speak the rhema. They are part of the change of the age. This age will not change without the messenger. God will do again what he has forever done. How encouraging is that to you? <laughs> Sobering too, huh? There's a responsibility upon the messenger to believe and to have faith. Even when, as Noah, the whole environment around him is one of death, selfishness, unbelief. So, in accordance with the rhema, God, the rhema releases, the Son, especially as that pertains to the giving of himself that comes with that rhema, potentially if that vessel will hear and receive beyond simply hearing, but God's heart is become my messenger, become something to me, become my vessel, not of this world not of what's around you. See what happens? God sets the messenger apart to himself. That's what I'm saying. He sanctifies the messenger. That means he sets the messenger apart to himself. You're a sanctified messenger. Drew, I recognize that. That's not telling you anything new. I'm just saying it publicly. I recognize it. There's others. 
His may not be preaching, but I can hear it in what is being sung. And more than that, I see it in the life of Christ in the man. It's real. It's the real Jesus. I don't need to tell you that, but I am saying it publicly. And he didn't pay me anything. Brian paid me off. But I mean... <laughs> I mean, I asked him, but Bethany threatened his life. If he, <laughs> you pay him something, I'll kill you. No. <laughs> God brought you into this world, but I'll take you out. <laughs> Sorry, Bethany. <laughs> I was just thinking of that conversation y'all had last night. No, <laughs> totally kidding. <laughs> so, let's go on. So that by faith Abel offered Christ as God's sacrifice because of the rhema giving him a rhema. That passage is screaming this to us. The rhema is the overarching theme of the entire Hebrews, what we call Hebrews 11. God triggered in these vessels, and they believed. They believed in him. And they believed in him, and thus they believed what he said. And when you believe in him, that's a great combination. When you believe in him and you believe what he said because you're coming to know him, and you, this is triggering that in you to walk with him, Enoch, be in him, found righteous, believing in him as your righteousness, Abel. Don't be like Cain, thinking he could be righteous by a thing. The righteous one in you makes you righteous. Ours is as filthy rags. He's my righteousness. Christ is my righteousness. That's what Abel believed. Cain didn't. A faith Enoch walked with God. God... The rhema appeared to Enoch and brought the rhema and Enoch walked with God to the point that Enoch was taken. See how it works? God's taking, you can see this, I talked about it last night. There in Genesis, God is putting people out. But then there are those who are his who are getting out to the Lord. We want to be those not who get put out in fact, God ends up destroying the whole world. That's how put out from him they are, put away from him. But instead, we want to be those who come out to him, right? And that's what God is saying to us, come out to me. Don't be of this. Again, I'm not talking about not having a job. I'm saying we're in it, but we're not of it. We are not of Babylon. I'm going to know that about my, in truth about myself. I'm not of Babylon. I'm not of this stuff. God's going to destroy it, and I know it. How about you? He has declared it. I believe him. And you won't convince me otherwise. It, human history has shown it to be true. So yes, the book of Revelation is going to come to pass. Babylon is going to be destroyed in one hour by the Lord. The merchants of the earth are going to weep over that fact. You read that passage. God is going, Christ himself is going to come. He's going to grab hold of the beast and hold of the false prophet and cast them. Is he not? We believe that. Has it happened? Of course it hasn't. Will it? Yes. We're like Noah. God's told us something that's not seen yet. And we're believing in him. It's called faith. We believe in him and what he says therefore is true. And there's the faith of the Son of God, the rhema, operating in and through us. They all heard the rhema word from God and they believed. But the end of Hebrews is an amazing statement because ultimately it was who they were believing in. And that is proven at the end of Hebrews. They all believed but yet did not obtain the promise. Now let's step back and look at that. What is being said here? Because that sounds contradictory, don't you think, Jeff? Well, the flood came. What God promised was going to happen. Here's the relationship. God was promising Noah more than just escape from the flood. He was promising him himself. They knew Genesis 3.15 without being able to quote a Bible because there wasn't one.
They knew what had been said to Eve, the mother of all the living. Right? Isn't that why her name is called Eve? She's the mother of the living. She's not the mother of the world of the dead. She is the mother of the living. And they knew that she had been promised something, the coming of what would be called Messiah. But there in that passage is there's a seed coming. And it's the gospel of the seed, by the way, that God preached to Abraham who then lived it out. There's a seed coming. And his name is Messiah, the anointed one, the Christ. And it was that person of life that would come to them in mystery of mysteries, not yet revealed, would come in them as life to where what was really promised them. That's what they didn't receive. As Hebrews clearly states, because they were waiting on the generation, could have come way sooner, in which Christ himself, Messiah, would come, and without them understanding it, because this would be revealed to the apostles and prophets, Christ in you, the hope of glory. They had no concept of that. They just knew the anointed one was coming from Genesis 3.15. Now that was the main promise, the Lord, that they were after. And so must we. Or we miss the main point. Knowing the Lord in ever-increasing way up until... This is their journey. They knew the Lord, but they wanted to know him in the fullness. Don't you? And they knew that fullness would come with his coming in, let's just say to them, what they couldn't understand yet, even more glorious, his coming in a people. Right? And that that coming in a people must take place first before he comes to end the final age and put Babylon forever away, rule and reign in Jerusalem, right? Thousand-year reign of Christ. Destroy Babylon. Cast the beast and the false prophet into hell. So, I've got a few moments here. The Ramah's release to the vessel is going to require something. I've been talking about it, but let me say, it's going to take believing faith. It's going to take courage. It's going to take divine alignment. It's going to take commitment and cooperation with the Lord. It's going to have cost, and it's going to have suffering. It's going to entail sacrifice. And if that's not true of that vessel, then the rhema himself who speaks the rhema and in us becomes, and this is his call out to us, huh? To be fully his. And unless we're willing to be, right, Drew, Second Chronicles 16, 9 again, right? He's searching for those who are wholeheartedly is. And unless that's true, that rhema given by the rhema will be of no effect. But if the rhema has effect in the messenger by their wholeheartedly giving themselves to the Lord, to know Jesus Christ like Paul. I want to know him. God help us for that to be that first call and stay ever increasing. The spoken rhema will come and go, but the life of the rhema in us will only grow. So that we become living 
epistles read of men. There comes into this, in the messenger themselves first, and thus by word and example, proclamation, testimony, by the foolishness of preaching, unto corporately a full measuredness where we are no longer tossed about. Isn't that something? By every wind and wave of doctrine. We have discerned the truth of the rhema and the logos and how he triggers, how he speaks how he in his foreknowledge knows. He does not not cast his pearl before swine. He's not speaking to those who refuse to listen. Not directly. They'll hear the gospel through the messenger, but he's not coming to them. He's going to come to the one by foreknowledge he knows. God does know, right? They will listen, and he'll speak to them. He doesn't speak to fools. Who won't obey. Not in this way. I'm sorry to say it that straightforward. Would y'all want it any other way? He knew Noah would listen. He don't waste his energy somewhere else. Noah's got the rhema. That's how it works, guys. It's not only that, oh yeah, he believes in me. Noah will be a messenger. Hear this, Brian, and will follow it through all the way. And God brings the, the rhema brings the rhema to a vessel that will go all the way with him. So let me say to you, messengers, is there, are we any different? We're called to go all the way. Be wholeheartedly given over to him. Amen, amen. I say that before the Lord. I renounce my own way, my own truth, my own life, my own everything. I renounce this world. I renounce my flesh. I renounce all that my soul would crave. Instead, I determine to know him and be his. May he seal me forever unto himself. I belong to him. Is that not Malachi 3? Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another. Isn't that right, guys? They shall be mine, declares the Almighty, in the day that I make up my treasured ones, and I will protect them as a father protects his own son. Because they have come to sonship like Isaac. I don't have time to preach this. It's a whole message. Like Isaac, what is that sonship? I will be sacrificed unto the glory of God. Now, that's sonship in its final testimony. I will, Father, let you kill me unto the glory of God, just like the Son of God was put to death, not by just the Romans. Isaiah 53, it was the Lord's pleasure. They don't want to translate that rightly. They'll say will. That is not the meaning of the Hebrew word. It was the, here's the Hebrew word. It was the ecstatic joy of the father to put his death to the, his, his bring death to his son. Unto what ends? Unto a family. That's what. <laughs> Praise be to God. In his wisdom, in his love, and all that he is doing to capture us. To possess us, we were created for him. Let him possess us. Let him possess us. Let's let him possess us and let's be possessed of the Lord, right? So the messenger allows the Lord to have his full life and effect, especially let's come to the New Testament now to what Peter is saying. Let's not forget the Ramus. God, you got to know this about yourself. God. Gave opportunity. He brought the gospel of his son, his son who is the gospel. And we obeyed or we didn't. And if we did, if we said yes, he's after possession. That's why we were created. He's not being selfish. God is not selfish. He created us with the intent of lavishing and giving himself fully to us. Does that seem selfish to you? So much more to this message, but anyway. Let us align 
And let us be aligned inwardly and thus outwardly, transformingly affected by an ever-growing measure of Christ. It's what it means to be a messenger, and it should be what it means to be a part of his body. As goes the messenger, as goes the body. It's what it's meant to be. First step, the messenger. Then the body. With every intent to bringing himself to that body as fullness of life. It is clear to me, isn't it to you, that God revealed the mystery of mysteries to the apostles and prophets. Quoting the scripture, let me remind us of a divine principle. I've been talking about it all morning. And the Lord said it to me himself some years ago. I'm going to repeat history, Terry, in the end. I'm going to speak again to the apostles and prophets. That's what makes them apostles and prophets is he begins them on that life, on that way, on that truth of Christ my all in all. And they become a messenger of him and what he says, of his eternal will, of his eternal purpose, of his eternal desire in Christ, of Christ, unto Christ, for Christ. And here in the end, he's going to have again those who he speaks to concerning himself and concerning his will in readiness, which is a must, right? That's what I'm describing, Noah's readiness. The messenger's need for readiness to be his fully, to not be our own, to lose our life by gaining Christ as life. That readiness. No independent spirit, remember? The four things. No wrong form of worship, but a form of worship that bows to the Lord, not ourselves. Anyway. Readiness. So that there can be a people corporately transformed to his likeness, conformed to his image, formed, having Christ formed within them. If these things become inwardly, personally, and corporately true and realized in full measureness, then the mission of God will be fulfilled with the messenger and into his body. The rhemas of God, the work of God, the true gospel of Christ, the revelation of Christ within, on and on and on, all will be fought against by multiple enemies. Philippians chapter 3, that many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Speaking of the church now, their end is destruction, their God is their stomach, their glory is in their shame, they are focused on earthly, fleshly things. If you're going to go on with God, you're going to have to know who your enemies are. There's enemies of the cross. They're enemies of God. There's their enemies thus of the message of the cross, the word of the cross. They're enemies of it. Then there's the battle with the devils. And then there's the battle with the governments of this world, the kingdoms of this world that set themselves up against the Christ. There's battles with the organizations of man that as well have set themselves up against Christ. Babylon. Governmentally, organizationally. Is that not right? Financially. Religiously. Babylon. Within the body of Christ, there are deceivers who are self-deceived and also deceiving others. Their teachings, was warned, will spread like gangrene through the body. We are told they must be stopped. Until, what an ending. Oh, it's only a few minutes after 12. Isn't that amazing? Until, and this is another message and I'm not preaching it. 
But we sung about it last night, Drew. It was, it was so beautiful because the Lord had spoken to me earlier in the day and then we, the Lord has you sing about it. Revelation 22. The need for a vessel that is crying out in this time. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Maranatha. Come, Lord Jesus. Revelation 22, verses 6 through 21. It will always be a necessity for God to bring that vessel to that reality, to a state of readiness, to where in the state of readiness they are crying out, even so, come, Lord Jesus. The church doesn't seem to think that's important. God knows from whence that cry comes. It comes from a people who are ready and want the Lord to come as he wants to come and put by his own doing the breath of his mouth and the brightness of his appearing an end to Babylon and end the age. So let's stand. I'm asking that we would be such a people I'm asking for the full measure of Christ and not some low level. Let's not settle for low level things, right? It is not a gift that is needed. It is a inward work of the Lord concerning our desire and our willingness to be his, fully his. It's the gift of Christ that's needed, right? I'm asking the Lord because of readiness to now bring forth out of the human corporate vessel his people on the earth that Revelation 22 cry, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus, but not from a doctrine, from the inward man where Christ happens to dwell, the Father dwells in the Spirit. A cry of readiness, a cry of, yes, Lord, amen, so be it, come, Lord Jesus. Having come in us, having worked in us, having brought and bringing us to readiness, it comes, it bubbles up by the Spirit out of us. Come, I am not of this, and I know you have promised a day that when I'm not of this, no longer of this, that I recognize I belong to you and I walk that out rightly, that you will fulfill the fact that I'm no longer not just not of it, I'm not in it. You will extract us out and destroy by fire the entire world. That's what Noah was looking for. By flood, not fire, but we're looking at fire. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Amen? Amen. Wow, profound, profound message. Yeah, everybody just be seated just for a minute. Yeah. It's uh, one of the hardest things uh, to do is come up and try to talk after a, a profound message like that. Um, but uh, before we take up the offering, I do want to just talk. This is primarily to our church, our this fellowship, but uh, it, it could be for everybody as well. We had, as we prayed for... As we prayed for this conference, uh, obviously there's a lot of warfare associated with it and all that, but as we were praying for it, we really had this sensing that it was going to be a profound time in the Lord, a time of breakthrough, uh, a, a time of real uh, impartation, and even to initiate a, a shift in our hearts in, in this fellowship. And... Um, I absolutely believe that the Lord uh, granted that sensing and that, uh, that prayer that it would be that. This has been a profound weekend for us. Um, and I think it goes beyond our fellowship as well. But I really do believe it's been a profound time. For this fellowship is, is called, and Brian is called to lead it, absolutely to lead it. This fellowship is called as, a, as that messengerial builder vessel uh, 
And, and you know that if you go to our fellowship, you know that we've been called as that, as that vessel. Uh, and yet we need that catapult. Uh, we've, like Alice's word, I shared it on Friday night. That we've, we've reached a plateau. We, we have. We've reached a plateau. And uh, God in his goodness has come uh, and given us a, a fresh invitation, uh, charge, a catapult, hopefully, into a new level of progression into that vessel. And, you know, there's a lot to digest with what's been spoken this weekend. And I think for our fellowship, I want to just really challenge us, you know, Go to YouTube, get all the videos, and watch them again. Where you can pause it, take notes, meditate on the various points that are made. Let's slow down and digest everything that has been spoken, because it is a it is a rima word to us in this hour. We we desperately need to heed it, and that's that's the, I think the key thing I want to close with. Let us heed this message and not pass it over as just, hey, this was a great conference. We had a great time and we must heed it because there, there's no doubt God spoke loudly, spoke boldly, uh, and it's to every one of us uh, in, in, in this fellowship and probably beyond that. Let us receive and deal with this and not, uh, and not pass it over. Uh, let it produce that hundredfold return. Amen? Amen. So let me just pray real quickly. Father, we ask that we would heed these words that you have so graciously given to us, Lord. Lord, I started this Friday night by quoting uh, Psalm 67, and I don't have it in front of me, but it was basically, Lord, be, it starts out, well, Lord, be gracious to us. And you answered that. And let us heed it, Lord. Let us heed it, this word, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, we want to do one more thing before we close. We're so appreciative of Cher Terry and Josiah and Isaac and the whole team and the powerful time. And we want to really bless them. We really want to bless them. So I want to just encourage everybody to, to give generously. Uh, you can give online for those that are watching online, especially those, those online. I want to challenge you to... Uh, to participate in this. Uh, you maybe weren't here personally, but you were blessed by the message, and you can give online at restorationlife.org and go to the Give tab and do that. Uh, and so uh, for those that are here and would like to, you could give online as well, but if you'd like to give uh, by check, or you can just make the check out to Restoration Life uh, and uh, Church, and we'll, we'll sort it all out and give... Uh, the love offering. So we really want to bless them now. So I want to really challenge you to give, give generously. So uh, guys, I'm going to get the guys to come up and to uh, take off the offering right now. And, uh, John.
All right, I think that's it. All right, thank you guys. What are, let's give a round of applause and, and some thanksgiving to the team and uh, bless them. And we do we pray that they, they would all get safely back, their car would run safely without any problems and protect them all and bless them in Jesus' name. Thank you for coming. Appreciate it.